All right. So, common, common thread of mine, I guess you could say, is always trying to find the best way, I guess, to explain to people what the difference is. Why is this faith we cling to or call you know, our own different from the rest of Christendom out there, all the other churches that proclaim to be churches of Christ in many different forms and fashions? What's the difference? Why is it different? And how can I best explain that? So that's what I want to talk about this morning. And uh, Corey's stewardship was great. Went right along with everything I want to talk about. I really appreciate that. Um, and something that I've always talked about, and I've heard other guys kind of hit on it here and there a little bit once in a while, but it's this idea of living in this new faith-based system that Jesus Christ brought in when he was on the earth with his ministry and then his death, burial, and resurrection to then go back to the Father and have the Holy Spirit come down to indwell in us so that we can basically, in a sense, be a self-governing people, to not have to just walk according to the, the do's and don'ts and the thou shalt nots, but actually in a forward motion, in a, in a, a forward-thinking mindset, actually walk through life with purpose and confidence, I guess, things like that. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. But before I get into all that, um, if you want to go to Mark chapter 2, there's a couple things I want to bring out to kind of set the tone. So Mark chapter 2. Uh, verse 27-ish. I'll probably back up a little just to get the context. Yeah, um, 23, Mark 2 and 23. says, Now it happened that when he, uh, Jesus and his disciples, went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? You know, whoop de doo here's Johnny Law Dog with Mr. Procedure. You know, you're not supposed to do that now. What are you guys thinking? I can just see Jesus just kind of rolling his eyes like, Yeah, okay, you caught me. Sorry. Well, he says, he says, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and ate the showbread which is not lawful to eat except for the priest and also gave some to those who were with him and he said to them the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath now think about that for a minute most people in an, an authoritative position uh, we, we've seen it in, in our history cultures and things people the humanistic idea of authority is to develop things that rain attention and puff yourself up. It's all about you, you know, give me. So they want the people to do this and do that. And if you don't, you know, I'll kill you and your family and you know, the threats. And they do all these things to puff themselves up. But what's Jesus saying here? He says, the Sabbath wasn't made for man. The Sabbath day isn't for God to be all proud and say, yeah, come on, you puny little pipsqueaks, it's my day, do what I say. He says, no, the Sabbath wasn't made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. See, we needed the Sabbath. God didn't. And that's, that's one thing that I want to bring out in this, this introduction. I'll just say it now, I'll probably say it again. You know, this whole idea of authority or positions of authority if you're going to be a good leader then your mind is set on service and Jesus brought that out very well when he walked on this earth and we'll look at a couple more things I think bring that out but see that's what he's saying here you needed the Sabbath this is for you it wasn't for me and uh, well it was brought out with the Hebrews context the blood and bulls and goats that he doesn't have any interest in that that was because he cared about the people 
that needed that system for that time so that they didn't have to be destroyed. It was a get me by till Jesus could come and offer the ultimate sacrifice so the sins could be forgiven. He gave that to us. It wasn't the other way around. That's very important when you think about it that way. It gives you a whole different outlook on what's going on and what God wants here. Another verse that I kind of tie in with that is uh, Matthew 9 in verse 13, again, uh, well, verse 11, when the Pharisees saw, saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Okay, you know, Jesus is eating with the, the, the scum, you know, and that's, here's Johnny Law Dog again, what are you doing? You can't be doing that, that's wrong, that's not what we're about, you know, get with the program, guy. So then Jesus heard that, said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, he desires mercy, not sacrifice. That's not what he's about. That's not what this is for. In a lot of ways, the sacrificial law that was set up for the people was God showing his mercy. Because he didn't have to do that. But he cared about them. And he didn't want them to be destroyed. So he gave them that system to get them by. Out of his abundant mercy. He desires mercy, not sacrifice. And we won't go there. Because I'll get off too far. But in John 13... You know, when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, once again, I believe that is a show of good leadership in the form of service. Now, that's not the only thing to take away from that, because he does say, you know, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. So there is, I believe, the, the precursor, the example of needing to be washed with, you know, obviously, you know, the sins are washed away in the baptism. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, it all fits together. I do believe that is part of that context that is being brought out, but I don't think that's the only thing. For him, the creator, the expressed image of the Father, the, the architect of this whole plan, to wash the feet of his disciples, what is he saying? I care about you. What I do, I do for you. Why did he die on the cross? Well, for his sins, it's for ours. It was for theirs. Again, service. Service. So think about that. You know, it's not about coming to church to just do the commandments of God. This is, this is a, a get to. We get to do this. This is for our benefit because, see, mankind has a spiritual side. We can't spend every single waking moment of every day doing things of the world. We need a day to just be cool and feed the other side of us, the spiritual side. We need this. So he gave this to us. So let's think about things kind of in that sense as we start to go through some of this. Now, the Old Testament, the Law of Moses, Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not, so on and so forth, we got all that. And now we know Jesus was the testator, as Hebrews brings it out, of the new covenant. Here's what I believe. In order to live in the faith-based system, in the new covenant that Jesus has installed for us, it requires the person, not gives them the opportunity to, but it requires the person to live without rules and without law because it's freedom. That's what freedom is. Freedom is only found in the faith. And I'll, I'll get to some verses, but just think about that for a minute. And again, I'm not saying that the law and the rules just don't apply anymore. They're still there. They didn't go anywhere. But the difference is the people that this system develops are not the people that need to be told don't do that because they aren't there in their mind. They don't want to do those things. It's still there. 
but they're just keeping it in a completely different way by simply moving forward to be more Christ-like, which by default takes them away from a list of parameters that you must live in. See, that's the difference between a spiritual person and a carnal person. A carnal person, you got to tell them, don't do that. A spiritual person, you don't have to tell them that because that's just not who they are. So, uh, back up right there in Mark. Well, I guess we went away from there. Go back to Mark. And uh, just back up a little bit from where we were, say, uh, 20, Mark 2 and 20, Jesus speaking again says, The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days, talking about his, his own departure. And he says, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth in an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old. The tear is made worse. No one puts new wine in old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put in the new wineskins. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about, about this requires. It requires us to leave that old system completely. We cannot add a little patch in or put a new wine in the old skins. A little bit here, a little bit there. No, he's, he's trying to get people to understand, look, that was your system then. I know it's comfortable for you and familiar and it's easy for people to understand. That was kind of the point. But don't stay there. Now we need to go this way. Come on. We're going to go to something better and something greater. So leave that behind. We'll get to those verses later. So that's what I'm talking about here. Um, so then, okay, go to, go to John 8, another very familiar passage. But let's look at this and what he's saying here and who he's saying it to. See, this, the whole idea and this difference I keep talking about, this new abundant life, you know, the quality of life we can have uh, through developing a relationship with God, the freedom aspect. In John 8 and 32, he's talking to the Jews. These are God's people. They're very familiar with the law. They've lived with it forever. But Jesus says to them, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, that, to me, that's present or future tense. You shall know. In other words, implying that they didn't know that truth is not found in the law. Because the truth of, I guess if you wanted to say there was truth in the law, well, it didn't make them free because, again, he's saying it will make you free. As in, you are going to now know truth, and that will now make you free in regards to the other system you had that didn't have truth, and it didn't have freedom. Because they said to him, we're Abraham's descendants, have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus said, well, sure, they say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So he's talking to the Jewish people. They had the, the, the law. They knew. They knew the scriptures, the Old Testament, but it wasn't making them free because it wasn't truth. So why would we want to cling on to that now when we do have truth? And it does make us free. The just shall live by faith, right? We've all heard that, heard that verse. It's repeated a few times. But the quote actually comes from the Old Testament. It's out of Habakkuk, Habakkuk, what, however you say it. It's one of the minor prophets. So just, just turn back and let's look at the original quote here. So it's just kind of between Zephaniah, you got Micah, Nahum, and then Habakkuk. Look at chapter 2 and verse 4. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. Verse 4, it says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Did you catch that? There's another word in there. It doesn't say the just will live by faith or by the faith. No. He says the just shall live by his faith. 
You see what that means? You own it. It's yours. You develop it. You, one-on-one, -on -one, from the heart of man to the heart of God, from the mind of man to the mind of God. You develop your faith with your creator, with God. You will live by your faith. However, you choose to develop it as far as whether you do or you don't, as far you know, the magnitude, how much effort you put into developing your faith, exactly what you'll get out of it. But that's how you will live. The just shall live by his faith, by my faith. I will live by my faith. See, to me, that's a huge difference. Because now I've, I have stake in this. I own that. That's mine. That's my part to do. Let's uh, go to, back to the New Testament. Um, if you want to find that, I said that it was quoted a few times in the New Testament. Romans 1.17, Hebrews 10.38, both uh, quote that, that we just read. Um, and Galatians 3, and that's the one I want to go to right now to grab a little bit more insight into this. So Galatians 3, start uh, verse 6. It says, just as Abraham believed, let me grab my stopping point so I don't mess up. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. It is, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Will live by his faith. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for as written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Held under bondage, under the curse of the law. Nowhere to go. Thou shalt not go offer your sacrifice, scumbag sinners, and do it again next year. What a depressing way to live. Why would anybody want to hold on to that? Because it's comfortable. Because along with faith and freedom comes responsibility. I mean, think about it. Why do people want somebody else to do everything for them or tell them what to do? Because they hate freedom? No, they hate responsibility. They don't want to have to be responsible for it. Just do it for me. And that way, if it doesn't work, it's your fault, not mine. And somebody else will do something else for me. That's just laziness. That's all that is. We are set free. We have truth that makes us free. We can now live in this wonderful system of faith with a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our God, with our Creator. We shouldn't shy away from that responsibility of choice. We should welcome it. Because it's so much better than the curse of the law that was the alternative. There's nothing in that. There's no life in that. It's now in faith that we walk. In order for Christians to excel in this new life, we must put away the safety net of the law and accept our freedom in faith and not be afraid of the responsibility that comes with it. Drop on down. Stay right there. Galatians 3. Grab uh, uh, verse 22. But the scriptures can find all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith. In Christ Jesus. You see that? You see what he's saying? That was the get me by. That's what you needed to get started. Now we're moving past that. Now we're going into something completely different. Forget all that. 
And just, just, just think about it. I've thought about it. Just think about it. You ever notice in the Old Testament when he's talking about God's people, they're always referred to as the children of Israel? Now, obviously, that's in reference to their lineage. You know, I, I get that. But they're always referred to as children, children of Israel. But in the New Testament, we're joint heirs with Christ. We're sons and daughters. We're royal priesthood, if you want to go that far. You see the difference? This is a system of maturity. This is no longer juvenile no, 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 I'm going to hit you with the yardstick of commandments. No, no. We're adults now. We're grown-ups. We don't need that anymore. We don't need a tutor. We're going to walk with our God now. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm talking about here. I think it's great. I think it's a great, great thing. All right, so here's what I'm getting at. Psalms 33 and 15, God fashions our hearts individually. Psalms 32 and 8, also Matthew 23, 8 and 9. God is our teacher and our instructor. 2 Peter 1 and 3 says he's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. So what does it all mean then? I think too many times people confuse removing sin with trying to change who they are. And what I want to show is that God knows you, made you specifically and for a purpose... And also that the individual relationship developed between the heart of the person directly to God is the whole point and outside influences, stereotypes, and preconceived ideas can ruin all that. Now, what? A, again, I'm not talking about us. I'm not talking about this assembly. I'm talking about my frustration is when I'm trying to talk to somebody or reach somebody They've already had a run-in with some Church of Christ guy, and it probably wasn't so good. So they've already got me pegged before I even open my mouth. And that is so frustrating when you want to help people and give them real guidance that they can really use that's really going to affect their life. And they're like, stay away from me, man. I don't want to hear it. I've, I've met you people before, you know. Well, you, you people. Who you people? You don't know me. You know what I'm saying? Give me a chance. Let me show you. You wouldn't believe the, some of the stories I've heard talking to people. I mean, you know how congregations are. You, you know, say about this size, maybe a little bigger. If somebody's going through something or there's a problem, you know, people probably heard about it. You know, the rumor mill. They're in churches too. They're not just in workplaces or schoolyards. And yeah, I remember people, this one guy telling me about how the, the pastor pretty much called him out from up front. You know, left his name out of it, but used all the specifics of the thing that was going on. He's like, man, I was so embarrassed, I never went back again. And it just infuriates me. I feel like, you know, Jesus dealing with those Pharisees. You jokers, what do you think you're doing? You don't do that. What, what, what's the point of that? To help them? Yeah, right. You're puffing yourself up. That's all that is, man. I, man, just it drives me nuts. And that's what we're up against. You want to reach somebody? Guess what? That's the first obstacle you got to get over is convincing them that you're not one of those. I tell you what, you give me five minutes in a dark alley with one of those clowns, they'll be seeing the light all right. Me and ambulance come and take them to the hospital. Because there ain't no point to that, man. That's the same reason Jesus went in the temple flipping them tables over and running them out with a whip. And again, Jesus was sinless, so how did he get away with that? Because what they were doing was wrong, and it was killing the people. And that is not what God's all about. He says, you will not make my father's house a den of thieves. See, there's a difference between being angry and being passionate about the righteousness and the goodness of God. That's a difference. That's a difference that we can have in the faith-based system. Walking, not according to rules and laws, but according to our faith that we develop with our Creator. That's the difference. So, okay. Now, the plan of salvation is set in stone. It's not changing, not getting around it. It is what it is, and it's a perfect plan. There's nothing wrong with the plan. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Then there's plenty of examples and plenty of verses to back that up, show how that's done, no problem. But then what? Then what are you going to do with the rest of your life? See, that's where everybody starts to get 
get uh, downtrodden or start taking detours or exits or finding something else to do or this isn't working, you know, as time goes on, the days drag on, nothing's really changing, they, you know, they fizzle away. So what are you going to do the rest of your life? Okay, well, here's, here's an I think. Here's what I think. Now, obviously, Romans 8 and 29 For whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Image of his son, obviously meaning character. We can't transform into a Middle Eastern Jewish people. That's what Jesus was, looked like. We can't do that. So obviously it's the character that we need to develop. Okay. Well, let's add some things up then. So, if we need to spend the rest of our lives conforming to the image of Christ, and Jesus said to Philip, John 14 and 9, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And God is the Father, and also, God is the Father, and, well, God, God is love, okay? That's uh, 1 John 4 and 8, that's how he's described, that God is love, okay? So we have that, so... If Jesus tells Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and the Father is love, and we know what love looks like, because we have 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, then we can know exactly what we need to do, and that alone should be our focus. Now, so let's go to that. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. And this passage is more than just a feel-good passage to talk about at weddings. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. Because, see, we do need to make a change. We do need to be different than we used to be. But we need to do it the right way. If you're trying to fix something, you can't just grab the tools out of the toolbox and throw it at it. you got to research it. you got to troubleshoot it. you got to figure out, okay, what's the problem? And surgically, sometimes, fix what's wrong with it so that the thing will run. And that's what we need to do here. We can't just... Say, okay, uh, we got the we got the faith, we got the spirit, we got everything we need, and change. Change into what? Look at this. First Corinthians 13. After what we just laid out, Jesus is the expressed image of the Father. The Father is love. Here's what love looks like. Verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. I added, doesn't keep score. Another way to look at that. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. Rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. And by the way, that believes all things, that doesn't mean believe everything you read on Facebook or on the news. That means believe all things in Christ. Believe all things that God has given us. Believe all truth. Walk in faith. That belief. Believe all things. Love never fails. So here's the thing. Does that resemble you? Can you think back in your life at that list and remember times that stick out in your mind where you've been that? Whether it's been to other people or even if it's been to yourself. Because you know what? Sometimes we need to give some of this to ourselves too. Sometimes people are harder on themselves than they, they should be. Maybe they're nicer to other people than they are to themselves. I mean, it's not all just outward. It's inward too. But can you look at that and say, yeah, that's me. Or, well, I, I definitely need to work with that one. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, you know, that's, uh, that depends on the day on that one, you know. But that should be our focus. If we want to become like Christ in his character, if we want to be, you know, the Christians God made us to be, to be the light to the world, that needs to be in our minds. That needs to be our list. Well, you may be saying, now wait a minute. Why didn't you go to Galatians 5? That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what we should be going off of. We're going to have a list. And, you know, some people need lists. My wife needs lists of her list to keep track of the list. It's a human thing. I don't know. 
But people like to have lists, so God gave us a list. Wasn't that nice of them? Well, here's why I didn't go to Galatians 5, because it's the fruits of the Spirit. Well, you can't have fruit if you don't first plant the tree, and the tree grows. That's why. So, again, saying there's a difference, wanting to make the difference easily understood so people can see it and they can know in their own life that it's working, that they're on the right track, we have it all laid out. That's exactly what we need. So we go through the plan of salvation. We try to adhere to being this person right here at 1 Corinthians 13, this kind and, 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 and uh, you know, kind person. I don't know how else to say it. I could just read it again, I guess. You know, a non-envious person, a, a, a not-parade-yourself-around person, a not-behave-rudely person, thinks no evil person. See, if you do all that, if you become this person, then you will have the fruits of the Spirit. And that's how you'll know that this is working. See, you, you grow the tree, you get the fruit. You get the fruit, you know the tree is good. The tree is grown. That's how that works. So we have it all so we can manage ourselves. Again, not needing rules and regulations or Pastor Joe Schmuckatelli to tell us what we need to be doing. We learn from our Father. We learn from the Creator. He's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, remember? So we have all that. Now, one of the byproducts of this, of doing this, is also then it roots out the sin in a person's life. So see, if you're, if you're all this, then you won't be all that of, of a carnal nature. That's how that works. So instead of trying to just jump over all these steps and just trying to uh, you know, get bad behaviors out of your life and thinking that's going to be good enough. Well, it doesn't work that way. You can't. It's pointless. Look at uh, Colossians 2. Colossians 2 and 20 says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. Think about that one for a few minutes. Self-imposed religion. False Humility, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Because it doesn't grow a good tree. Because there's nothing on the inside. It doesn't deal with the heart. Anybody can just get bad behaviors out of their life in an attempt to try to avoid hell. But that is not God's own special chosen people. His royal priesthood is joint heirs with Christ. That is not what that produces. That is not what he's looking for. He says, big deal. Self-imposed religion, false humility. Whitewashed tombs, you're empty inside. There's nothing in that. No. Take on my character. Let my spirit be seen in your life because it is just flat who you are. That's the difference. Okay, so the conclusion here of all my rantings. Consider the idea then that God does so much for man, giving us all things that we need, again, with the, the Sabbath rest and the, the mercy and not the sacrifice, the dying on the cross, all done for us. He gives us all things, and all things pertaining to life and godliness, everything we need. He does all these things for us, wanting to adopt us, tell us we're joint heirs with Christ, give us all different but needful talents and a list of things to put in our hearts to rid us of the sin, saying, learn from me, not imperfect man, and take it and enjoy the freedom and welcome the responsibility of choice, confident 
And whatever you do, you know you walk with God. That's the difference. And that's where we need to be. And that is my hope for everyone here and anybody listening in internet land is to don't just take what you've experienced or what other people have told you or anything like that and think that this is some exercise in routinism of coming to church on Sunday and, and all those various things that go along with that. This is so much more. This is, this is a pattern that we can live our lives by every day of the week. And look, I'm just speaking from experience. You know, that, I wouldn't waste my time coming down to a church building on Sunday if that's all it was, with some feel-good stuff. You know, I, I don't, it doesn't interest me. I wanted answers. I wanted to know what the heck is going on. And it's the truth that I found in these scriptures that has changed my life. And hey, listen, this has been a tough year. Don't think for one minute it ain't been tough on me. I've been wrestling with God more this year than I ever have. I had less problems with God when I was drinking and smoking and doing drugs. And here I am in the church and living right and doing all these things. And I still have them struggles, man. Of course you do. This world is tough. And the only way we're going to get through is when we develop our faith and we can walk with God. Because you know what? Here's something else to think about. Here's something else I've experienced, especially this year, since now I'm on that topic. There's sometimes you can be looking at a situation and you can see it, in a sense, both ways. Like, well, you know, verses start popping into your head. You've got to make a decision about something. So verses start flowing into your head. What should I do? Well, I can see, you know, according to this verse and this verse and this verse, I should go this way. Well, but this verse and this verse says maybe it, this would be a better decision. Sometimes there's not just a clear-cut yes or no, right or wrong answer. But here's the thing. We don't, we're not omniscient, so we do the best we can. We make the best choice we can according to the scriptures we have. So imagine, okay, then you die. Now you're in front of the Lord. He says, why'd you make that decision? Well, Lord, because of this verse and this verse and this verse and this verse. You know, I could just see him smiling and saying, you know, it wasn't necessarily the best way to go. Maybe I would have liked you to have gone the other way. But you know what? You thought about it. You went through the verses. You put some effort into it. So good job. See, it's not always just got to be about right or wrong because when you start thinking like that and then maybe it doesn't turn out the way you wanted it to, so now you think God's mad at you, so now your countenance falls, so then you just want to fizzle away and just give up because nothing's working out because things are always just going wrong. You got to get out of that. You got to stop thinking like that because that's not what it's all about. God wants his people, his own special people, to be one with him. His heart and mind, he's given us the things we need to do it. So he says, go. I've given you freedom, go. Don't be afraid of the responsibilities. Take it. You put the effort into it. You think about what you're doing. You do the, the best you can with the right answers that you have. And his grace and his mercy fills in the gaps. That's just an I believe. You can think of it what you will. So... We're not robots. This isn't an assembly line. Everybody's different, and for a reason. Does the sin need to go? Yes. Does the character need to change to the character of Christ? Yes. But is there good in the individual? Do you believe you're good? Do you? Deep down, do you believe you're a good person? I bet there's some people saying no. I have a hard time convincing myself that I'm a good person. But you know what? I believe that deep down... People are good. They've been so screwed up with this evil world. Maybe it's hard to find, but people are good. And you get the sin out of their life, you turn that, conform that image that we just looked at to Christ, and they will do amazing things. And it will be for the glory of God, because that's what it's all about. If only they'd make that choice. So thank you for your attention this morning.